Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome back to New 332 on uh, Monday, January 25th, 2021. It's good to locate myself in time. Um, and welcome back. This is the third uh, class. Uh, and today, the uh, two lectures, as you'll see on the syllabus, will relate to uh, sort of psychodynamics on the psychotherapy side and the five skandhas on the Buddhism side. Um, I may foreshorten these slightly, uh, both because it's an exceptionally crunchy day for a variety of reasons, um, but also because I'm aware that there are probably quite a few students that are, uh, you know, still kind of tip tapping away uh, on their um, first assignment. Uh, and so, yeah, I expect that there are probably a minority of students who are going to be like leaping to the fore at 1pm and that's good because it's quite possible it won't quite get uploaded by that time. So if, if you are waiting at the threshold at 1pm, I'll of course post an announcement to that effect, but uh, um, you know, I apologize if I'm keeping you waiting. Um, for everybody else, um, hopefully by the time you get a chance to uh, look at this, your your own workload and stress load, et cetera, are reduced or at least ameliorated to the point that you can um, sort of take this in, in a relatively speaking, open and leisurely fashion. Okay, so uh, we're starting on the psychotherapy side today. And so I wanted to continue this kind of line around the historical development of uh, psychotherapy from sort of its earliest roots. Last week, we talked about some of those roots a little bit in terms of dissociation. You'll find that that's actually an ongoing theme, like we'll be covering it ongoing. Uh, I spoke with a student earlier today and was unpacking a little bit of this, particularly in terms of my theoretical work uh, in that area. <clears throat> but you'll find actually that it has sort of ongoing relevance uh, within the context of the course. And I hope to lay some of that groundwork today between the two lectures so you can see why. But the other thing that we talked about was um, hypnosis, which hypnosis and sort of mesmerism, I wanted to talk about as one of the early contributors to psychotherapy, right? And quite popular with the early practitioners, very early practitioners of psychotherapy um, as a kind of intervention technique. Today, I want to expand that and talk about psychodynamics more broadly. So um, as I alluded to last week, right, the kind of core insight of psychodynamics in general, okay, as a, as a model of the mind that is used within psychotherapy is relatively simple, okay, so first, it's that there is an unconscious mind, okay, so there is a component of your mind, which is not your regular consciousness. Now, for most of us these days, that is kind of an assumption and a given. Uh, most of the time we have that assumption um, absorbed theoretically, even if we don't have it practically. We are often surprised by the action of our unconscious mind, right? But the idea is that there are portions of your mind that are active, you know, doing things, contributing to your functionality or sometimes getting in the way of your functionality in various ways, but that your consciousness either doesn't have access to or has sort of intermittent, imperfect access to, right? So, um, this idea of the unconscious, many of you will be familiar with a kind of standard Freudian metaphor, right? Which is this idea of the iceberg, okay, the iceberg. And if you think about it, right, think back to Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. <clears throat> and it's like, you know, you have a water line, right, which is like here, and there is an iceberg. And what you can see above the water line is a small peak of ice, but there is a much vaster sort of mountain of ice underneath that surface, right? That's sort of huge. And that's indeed what your boat runs into if you're unlucky enough to be on the Titanic, right? So it's kind of iceberg. The conscious portion of your mind is sort of above that water line. And then there is a much vaster section, which is beneath. That's kind of a core idea behind the unconscious in general. So the first principle of psychodynamics is there is an unconscious, okay? The second principle of psychodynamics is that that unconscious, um, therefore, um, is not unified, right? The consciousness and the unconscious are not perfectly unified, and the unconscious itself has a variety of forces, components, parts, okay? So it's not a single unified thing. Um, I alluded to this last time, uh, and I'll, I'll use this term ongoing. It, this is my term, but <clears throat> I refer to this as the unitive bias, okay? And the unitive bias is this basic bias that we, we seem to hold as humans that we are singular unified beings, okay? That we are singular unified or singular unitive beings, okay? That we are one thing, right? And that 
right? That, that what we do and what we think and how we act all comes from this unified position. And it's easy to understand in a way how we get to that, right? There is a perception of continuity with our thoughts and our feelings and our actions. And there's an illusion that is somewhat maintained, right? For us with that, right? Our, the objects of our experience tend to present themselves in a unified way. We tend to experience ourselves mostly as being unified. You know, I am Anderson. And I, I think of myself in those terms and I think of having sort of a continuity with my past selves, right? I can think back to when I was 30 and when I was 20 and when I was 10, obviously not so well, the further back I get, but there's a continuity there that makes me feel like a unified being, even though my 10 year old self obviously is quite different than my current self in lots of ways, right? And even though I've had all sorts of moods and all sorts of feelings and all sorts of thoughts and so on, so there's this unit of bias. And one of the things that psychodynamics points out is that there are many events which occur to us that seem to indicate that that system is not as unified as we might typically think. Now, one of those that obviously got a lot of early currency, right, in psychodynamic theories was dream, right? And dream, which we will talk about more going on, but dream, when you think about it, is a very interesting phenomenon. Freud referred to dream as the royal road to the unconscious, right? The royal road to the unconscious. And what is it that makes it that royal road? Well, when you have a dream, and most of you will remember at least some of your dreams, a few of you will not have very good recollection of your dreams, some people will claim not to have dreams. It seems that, that science has undercut that, um, that in fact, you sort of must be dreaming uh, for your brain to remain functional, but you may not have very good memory you may not have very good access to that. Some people remember all sorts of dreams uh, and, uh, and indeed practicing that, right? Making an effort to like write your dreams down, consider your dreams, discuss your dreams often seems to strengthen recollection, okay? But the thing that makes dreams interesting is that we don't seem to plan them, but they're definitely going on in our mind, right? There are a lot of things happening, forces, things that we're experiencing, scenes, little stories, other characters we encounter and so on and so forth that we do not seem to be directly consciously responsible for and yet in most conventional interpretations are indeed occurring within the confines of our mind right and so the idea with dreams being the royal road to the unconscious is that this is revealing something about these processes that are going on in the unconscious that are not necessarily connected or not necessarily at least determined by our conscious awareness, right? So dreams can tell us, they can give us a kind of snapshot, right? Well, it gives us sort of a little drama that tells us a little bit about what's going on under the surface. Now, this idea that we are not singular unitive beings, right? Means that, you know, there are a variety of different forces, factors, right? Um, that are interacting, dynamics that are interacting below the surface in order to produce the overall phenomenon that we think of as ourselves and our activities. Now, the way that that is sort of divided up, how we think about it, how we systematize it, right? What, what labels we put on these different factors and what they're sort of doing and how they interact, that will tend to differ between different psychodynamic systems, right? So if you look at the Freudian system, that's gonna give you sort of one you know, sort of account, one map of these different parts of your mind, of your psyche, right? Uh, and if you're a Jungian, that's going to outline sort of a different account of those parts and how they interact, right? And what their dynamics are. And if you're an Adlerian, that's going to give you something different, right? So the different psychodynamic systems will have these different maps, different accounts, different emphases, right, about what those dynamics are and how they're interacting with each other. But ultimately speaking, they all share that core idea that there are these different parts and they're interacting and that those things then work together with what we think of as our regular consciousness to compose our psyche, to compose our regular action. Now, you know, just thinking about this off the top, you can see that this lines up very well, right, with things that we would uh, tend to consider sort of the consensus in science. So, you know, we have a lot of different brain areas, for instance, and, you know, we think that the brain is quite integral to consciousness and to the psyche. And we tend to think that, you know, these different brain areas, you know, are operating together, but they have dynamics between them. If you have a momentary um, uh, issue in one area of the brain, that can produce 
an unusual effect in your experience of your mind and consciousness. So, you know, if you suddenly have a, um, a small seizure, for instance, okay, where you have like an electrical burst of activity, and it occurs in one of the language centers of your brain, you may suddenly find that your language is disrupted, but everything else is fine, right? That's a very consistent kind of effect we see. And we see that when people have an injury, for instance, if they have a serious brain insult, but it's, it's localized in one way or another, that this can affect right, some aspects of psyche, but not others. And if you think about, there are all kinds of classic cases of this, right? So you know, one of the ones that we tend to focus on in Psych 101, right, or Psych 100, uh, is uh, the famous case of Phineas Gage, right? who was a guy who was a railroad worker and there was a, an explosion as they were doing the railroad and a railroad spike basically flew and flew through his head, <laughs> right? Uh, and he didn't die. They pulled this thing out. He was sick for a bit and he recovered. But when he recovered, right, all of a sudden he had a very different personality. Prior to this injury, he had been, you know, a pretty quiet, polite kind of guy. Afterwards, he was sort of hard drinking, he was foul tempered, he, and aside from the obvious stress of getting a spike in your head, um, it seemed to quite radically change his personality and yet it left him a largely functional individual, right? He could still do things, communicate, talk to people, do his shopping, right? But it had this radical alteration of his personality. And if you think about that, that in and of itself seems to be an indication that, you know, certain areas of the, of the brain, for instance, that are producing right aspects of the mind can be damaged selectively and that's going to have selective effects. It tends to indicate that it is not sort of a unified um, uh, mechanism in some sense, right? That uh, there are selective areas. Same thing, you know, if somebody has a stroke, for instance, right, or a micro seizure and their language center is impaired, they may suddenly lose the ability to speak, uh, but not to understand other people's speech or vice versa. If their ability to process language is disrupted, they may suddenly not understand what other people are saying, but they can speak themselves just fine, right? So even something like that, language, which we tend to think of as unified, actually turns out to be you know, multiple systems that are interacting in various ways. And if one of them is impaired in some way, that function can be disrupted while other functions are relatively intact. So all of that seems to be sort of support within science for this idea that there are sort of different components and parts that are interacting dynamically to produce the sorts of functions that we typically, um, you know, associate with sort of regular mental functioning, right, customary mental functioning. Okay, so once you get this idea that there is an unconscious and that we have these different dynamics, okay, you start to get a handle because the idea behind most early psychodynamic theories, essentially speaking, is that when people are experiencing um, neuroses or mental illnesses of various kinds, what's happening is that there is some kind of dysregulation occurring in the relationship and dynamics between these parts, okay? So it's a, it's a dysregulation of some kind that is caused by the relationship or dynamic between these parts. And remember, I did just mention the brain, but for most of these psychodynamic theorists, they're not primarily talking about the brain. They're talking about the psyche, the mind, and they're proposing that the mind has these functions. So I've tied brain in to make it a little bit more relevant in current scientific terms, right? And to sort of support that. But most of them are simply talking in terms of the mind. So let's cover a few of those sort of briefly. Um, so, you know, most famously, right, we have Freud. And even if you've never done a course in Freud, if you've never studied Freud, odds are you have a certain amount of just like baseline cultural material, right? You know things about Freud, right? You could understand a joke about Freud, even if you've never sort of read Freud or studied Freud or been taught Freud, right? Freud has been this enormous figure. And as I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of pieces of his theory that I would, you know, disagree with, although that goes for every theory. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there's no question that Freud was sort of a titan, right? That he, that he deserves his place in the hall of the immortals, as it were, uh, just for sort of bringing this stuff into the conversation into the cultural conversation, right? So the idea that um, that you are not, right, a singular being, that you are not completely in control of the aspects of your mind. And that indeed these interactions within your mind may be doing all kinds of things outside your conscious control, but that your consciousness can 
interact with those things in various ways, and then that can be a way of improving your, your mental health. Now, Freud in some ways sets the bar a little low uh, for my liking, as he is sort of on record for saying that the goal of psychoanalysis, right, the goal of Freudian psychoanalysis uh, is to convert uh, neurotic suffering into regular suffering. And well, that's true. We'll, we'll see why, why he said that, right? Um, I think most modern practitioners would tend to set their bar a little higher and right, try to turn you know, neurotic unhappiness uh, into regular unhappiness. They would maybe try to aim for a certain amount of regular happiness or at least contentment, but we'll take that as our jumping off point. So what can we say about the Freudian system? Okay. The Freudian system, as I said, is a system of parts and you know, the, the sort of the big three-way division that most of us learn, okay, the big three parts that most of us learn are uh, the ego, the super ego, and the id, okay? The ego, the super ego, and the id. The ego is what we typically think of as our regular consciousness. It's that ego, right? It's that sense of ourselves, right? Anderson, that is the ego. But you've got these other two parts, the superego and the id. And in the Freudian system, these things are sort of, the superego is in a sense kind of over top of, okay, that's metaphorical, but it's sort of over top of the ego, and the id is beneath the ego, okay? Now, what do these two forces do? Well, the id, okay, is the place where all of our appetites reside, okay? So it's the piece of your mind that's concerned with appetites. It doesn't care that much at the end of the day about your conscious concerns. What it cares about is its appetites. It cares about food, it cares about sex, it cares about violence, right? It cares, it cares about a series of things and meeting those, those appetites. And it wants to sort of pull the ego uh, in its direction to get you to express those things. So, right? Um, the way that this shows up for, for Freud specifically is that the ego, um, when it's dreaming, gets, gets dreams that are sort of coded versions of those appetites, right? So it's like, um, and, and remember, right, Freud is doing his work um, in, a, in a particularly repressed uh, uh, period in Viennese society in Austria. Uh, and so, you know, Freud's work is like, look, people are having dreams where, you know, they, uh, you know, are having a conversation with somebody and then that person, you know, stabs them with a dagger. And Freud would say, well, actually symbolically, that's not a dagger, right? It's a penis. And the reason for this is that the idea of having a sort of sexual uh, image in that way is overpowering for the ego. It cannot handle this. And so instead, the id produces this image and it gets kind of coded into Right? It gets concealed, it gets hidden uh, by using this symbol so that it becomes sort of acceptable to the ego. But that the basic drives are the id wants sex and it wants to lash out at people around it and it wants to, right, like consume. And that's kind of what the id is interested in, these very animal levels of, right, these very animal levels of operation, sex, food, running away, attacking, right? this kind of thing. That's what the ego is concerned with. And the ego doesn't care about what, what your issues are, and it doesn't care about social rules at some level, right? It only experiences sort of these animal levels. Now, and so it's sort of pulling the ego in this direction. Simultaneously, the super ego is over top of the ego, and it's attempting to pull you up. And where is it trying to pull you? It's concerned with rules. It's got an internalized version of sort of your, um, your parents and society, right? And it's like, oh, 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 you know, you should behave in a pro-social way. You should be good. You should, right? Now, the tendency, and it's, it's pulling up. So there's like a tug of war where the ego is in the middle. Superego is pulling it up and the ego is pulling it down, right? And there's this constant tug of war that the ego is experiencing. Now, sometimes when people think about this, they think about it as being like, you know, oh, I'm the ego and there's like an angel and a devil on my shoulder that are trying to get me to do stuff. That's, 
kind of a good way to think about it, but it's wrong to think of the id as bad or evil and the superego as good and nice. It's more like, you know, the id is pulling us to this animal level and the superego was trying to pull us up to a particular kind of social level, right? Social level where we are socialized, right? But it does so in a way that frankly is often kind of repressive, right? It, it, it wags its finger at us. That is what it does. It scolds us. Okay, it scolds us. So the superego is up there scolding us. Ah, da, da, da. No, you shouldn't. You really ought to do this. You really ought to do that. Right? Whereas the ego is like, Ugh. right? <laughs> it's very concerned with appetites. Punch him. Ask her out. Eat that. Right? So this is the kind of tug of war that's happening, right, within Freud. Now it gets a little bit more complicated than that. This is not primarily a psychodynamics course, so we're not going to get at length into things like the death drive, or at least not here. We may talk about that down the line. But the point is, this is the sort of basic right, dynamic. And notice that that's a very hydraulic kind of system. And when I say hydraulic, what I mean is it's, it's almost kind of mechanical. It's like there are pressures that are pushing the ego up and down. And as the ego experiences this, this stuff, right, it experiences conflict. If the, if the id is grabbing it and trying to express like some kind of drive that is deeply unacceptable, the ego will experience a deep sense of conflict about this drive, right? And if that gets bad enough, that will start to show up in terms of symptoms and neuroses, right? You can't deal with your impulses. Now, if you know nothing else about Freud, you've probably heard jokes about the idea of, of you know, being, wanting to sleep with your mother. Right, that's like uh, that's sort of one of the big takeaways that the culture took from Freud, and indeed Freud does have a, a kind of operating theory around sort of stages of development and how those impact. And one of the things is that you know Freud basically thought that you know, there is a, sort of an, an underlying id stage where you know boys want to possess their mother, right? Take take them away from the father and have them to themselves and at some level sexually, right? And girls the same towards their father. And that therefore there is a competition, right? With the, with the um, same sex parent, right? That, so the idea is here that, you know, because boys unconsciously want to possess and sleep with their mother and kill their father, that their father might know this and castrate them right? There's like a castration fear. And there's sort of a reverse thing for girls. So that is sort of part of uh, Freud's ideas about sexual impulses specifically, and how those things manifest. We're not going to get into that too deeply quite yet, but just to give you a bit of baseline. Now, Freud sees the unconscious mostly as a place where we repress things. So when things pass into the ego, and we can't handle them, they're not acceptable in some way, they get pushed down. Right? So it's like throwing something into a dark basement to try to make it go away, but it doesn't go away. And it tends to come back in the form of dreams, it comes back in the form of neuroses and hangups and things, right? And so this is sort of, this is sort of the essence of the, of the Freudian unconscious. It's a place where we repress things, right? Where we repress things. Um, now, Freud was the pioneer of the specific method in therapy of uh, Freudian psychoanalysis or psychoanalysis. And if we take a look at that term for a second, we will see, right? Well, psycho, right? Mind uh, and analysis. Well, what's analysis? Analysis is the counterpoint to synthesis. Okay. So when we synthesize something, we're combining elements together in order to get a bigger hold, right? If you synthesize a chemical, what you're doing is combining chemicals together to get something. The opposite of synthesis is analysis, breaking something down, right? So when we do an analysis on something, we are breaking it down to try to figure out its individual parts. So when we talk about psychoanalysis, what we're talking about is a process of trying to break the mind down in some sense, not destroy it, not bust it into pieces, but rather try to right, do a process that allows us to see the individual components and stuff that are operating, the psychodynamics. So we talked about psychoanalysis, Freudian psychoanalysis. This is a process by which you explore dreams, fantasies, right? Your issues in various ways. And you do so to try to gradually get this picture of what the various forces fighting in your unconscious are doing and how that's impacting on you, okay? So that's kind of uh, the, the basics around that. 
I'm giving you a capsule because of course we are obviously going to, to come back to much of this material as we go, but it's kind of useful to think in those terms. Freud um, was extremely influential. He had a lot of um, sort of in influential followers in the first part of the 20th century as his theories became better known. There are two of those followers that I'm gonna look at quickly today because I think it's, it's sort of quite interesting. Um, so one is um, Carl Jung and uh, because I also teach um, Jungian theory and I'm a neo-Jungian myself, that's obviously of significant interest to me and I sort of know my way around. So Carl Jung uh, was one of those. The other one that we will talk about is a guy named Edward Bernays. And if you haven't heard of him, you, you I suspect will be fascinated by this. Okay, so Jung. Jung was a doctor, he was a psychiatrist, okay? Um, like, uh, like Freud himself. And uh, he came across, had already been thinking along these lines a bit, but he came across Freud's work and was so struck, right? That he wrote to Freud and they started exchanging theories. Uh, he went to visit Freud. Uh, and when he walked through the door the first time they sat and talked for 13 hours straight or something. And that kicked off what was effectively speaking a, a bit of a bromance, right? They had a very exciting early period of uh, collaboration. So much so indeed, that it was sort of known generally that Jung was sort of set to be the, the crown prince, as they called him. He was the one who was going to sort of carry the torch of Freud's theories forward. Um, and all that was fine until uh, the, the teens, right, a few, a few years later, uh, when Jung began to push back more strongly on a few of Freud's interpretations. One of these things was that Jung was concerned with the sort of excessive emphasis that he felt that Freud was placing on sex, okay? Sex as a motivation. And Jung felt that there were other things going on in the psyche, other motivations that people had beyond just this kind of sex, uh, sex drive as a, as a motivator within the unconscious. He believed that there were sort of other aspects within the psyche, so other psychodynamics, other than the ones that Freud was talking about. And eventually he published a, a paper on this, which was fairly high profile, um, in which he was talking about sort of the heroic elements in, in consciousness, right? Um, and specifically looking at the heroic elements in myth, okay? And both of them were very concerned with myths and fairy tales, right? As a as one of the sort of languages of the unconscious, right? A way of understanding um, unconscious dynamics. So Jung publishes this paper and it precipitates a sharp breakup with Freud. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, Freud begins to quite publicly uh, sort of denounce Jung and push Jung out of, of the circles around this stuff. And Jung in turn uh, has a really um, hard period. He, in some ways you could interpret what happens as he, he has a mental breakdown kind of, right? And this is occurring in, in midlife, uh, in his mid thirties. So it's a really serious thing. He had been on a certain path and then he had sort of disagreed and, and, and then everything kind of went to pieces. And the process by which Jung put himself back together in a sense, right? By which he explored what was happening to him during this, this sort of psychotic state where he was like really experiencing visions and voices and stuff, right? Ended up informing his system of, of psychodynamics. It ended up informing his sense of what's going on. Now, I can't give you, <laughs> can't give you a full version of that system here because uh, he wrote over like a 50 year span and he wrote a lot uh, and a lot of it is quite complex. Uh, and I teach a full year course on it and I can't even really cover it fully in that. So to give you an idea, but to give you a little bit of an idea, okay? So one of the big differences between Freud and Jung is that Freud's system is hy hydraulic, essentially speaking, right? The forces are pushing on each other, but they're sort of hydraulic, right? Mechanical in a sense. In Jung, the conception is very much that the mind is organic, right? That it's, that it's organism. And that in the same way as, you know, of course your brain is alive, your mind is alive and the parts of your mind are alive. If you think about psychodynamics in those terms, right? You begin to see that, you know, if we are not singular unified beings but we are sort of composed of these living dynamics then you might expect that those, those individual dynamics, those parts as it were, 
have to some extent properties that are like a mind in various ways, right? That they are themselves sort of entities that have thoughts about things that have sort of their own agenda, right? And that are interacting together in an overall system. So the Jungian system has a lot more parts, right? Archetypes and complexes as he, uh, as he labeled them. Uh, and so there's a variety of these things, right? You would have, uh, for instance, the shadow. Okay, so you still have the ego, but you have the shadow. And the shadow is the pieces of yourself that are unacceptable to the ego and that you've thrown away. Right? the things that you left behind, the aspects and potentials of yourself that you left behind, but also the things that you see as bad, evil, wrong, annoying, scary, right? And very often it's the case, right, that we, you know, we do push some parts of ourselves, right, into the, into the shadow because we don't want to interact with them. And sometimes those parts are, you know, antisocial, they're a problem. But a lot of the time it's just pieces of ourselves that we kind of left behind because we made a choice. So, you know, uh, at the age of 12 or something, right? You were like drawing instead of doing your homework and your parent came in and said, why are you wasting your time with this? Like you need to grow up. And that specifically maybe hurt so much that you like set art, set drawing aside. You're like That's not me, and you push it out. Well, you know, and then thereafter you thought artists were frivolous you yourself focused on not art, you know, like, you know, business or, you know, serious thinking, right? The point is that the, that kind of art piece, the part of you that loved that, liked that, might do that, ends up in the shadow. And so as we go through our lives, it's necessary not only to go into, encounter our shadow in various ways, to encounter the aspects of ourselves that we don't want to deal with, that we've sort of repressed, things that we did, right? So this is like the, you know, being awake at two in the morning and suddenly realizing, you know, thinking about that terrible thing that you did that you don't think much about, right? But also it's these parts of ourselves that we've left behind. This is the gold uh, in the shadow, right? Where it's like, oh, like I can bring that back. Like I used to do that. I can bring that back. I don't have to throw that away, okay? So the shadow, what else? Um, also in Jung, there's this idea of the, the persona. This is like the mask that we wear, right? Where we interact with, um, with the world and of course, we are not the roles that we play. And we get to make some choices about our persona, about how we're going to present ourselves, but some of those are given to us. It's a little like clothing, right? We must wear clothing. In certain circumstances, there's an expectation that you're gonna wear specific kinds of clothing that's determined by society, right? Um, but also we make choices in our clothing to express ourselves. So we reveal ourselves even as we're concealing ourselves, okay? That's persona. And the problems with persona very often are that people get too close to their persona, okay? So they, they come to identify, you know, you meet somebody at a party and you say, oh, you know, uh, nice to meet you, who are you? And they say, I'm a lawyer. Well, in that case, like lawyer is a thing that they do. It's a role that they play, a job, maybe even one that's important to them. But that level of identification, I am a lawyer, means they've got their mask on a little too tight, okay? And if you think about it, really, it's not one mask. We have many masks, right? You're a different person with your grandmother than you are with your friends, than you are with your boss, than you are with your lover, right? If you're the same person with all four of those people, usually something is a little off, right? Uh, if you behave in the same fashion with all those different parties, something is a little off. So you have these different masks that you wear, but the trick is not getting them too stuck to your face. You have to sort of remain flexible, right? Um, now, there are numerous other components. And if you get deeper into Jungian psychology, right, you, um, you get a sense of all of these different potentials and forces and stuff. It's a more complicated system in a sense than the Freudian system, um, but uses many of the same techniques, okay? So the idea also is you're doing a certain amount of dream analysis, right? You're looking at the events in your life and the things that, um, that bedevil you. And the idea is that like the Freudian psychoanalysis system, the Jungian system is interpretive. You're attempting to figure out, you know, you have a dream and you're attempting to figure the symbols out. Those methods of interpretation differ. So there are differences between Jungian and Freudian interpretation, okay? Just as there are differences in their sort of map of the various forces, right? Psychodynamics in the psyche. Um, so there are differences in those interpretations and there are differences in, in method, right? How you would interpret things, but also how you would sort of approach and apply 
ideas to try to come to a kind of consciousness, right? So there's a difference between those things. Um, but you can see that there is a lot of underlying similarity. And this is something that I talked about already, right? Um, no, nobody gets matter about being mistaken for an American than a Canadian. Well, Jungians and Freudians uh, have a long history of being pretty, um, pretty fiercely at odds, okay, with each other. Um, uh, I have always considered that to be a little bit silly, even though I come down uh, as a Jungian, just because there is so much that you have in common. Uh, and indeed, uh, many of you would know that sort of the, the former director of the BPMH program and, and one of the former instructors of this course, Tony Toniato, is a friend of mine. He was a, was a professor of mine and later uh, something of a collaborator and, you know, became a friend. And he's a Freudian. He trained as a classic Freudian, right? He, he did four days on the, on the couch, right? Lying on the couch and doing dream interpretation and the whole thing to train as uh, a Freudian psychoanalyst, in addition to the fact that he was a, a clinical psychologist, right? So he was already a clinical psychologist, but more recently, like in the last 10 years, he did Freudian analysis. And he and I, of course, used to have lots of conversations around this. Um, <clears throat> when I took his course many years ago, uh, when I took 232 many years ago, uh, I came in at one point and it had always thrown me a little bit that Tony was a Freudian. I was trying to sort it out. Um, he, he was a, uh, he is an interesting complex figure um, and sort of squaring off the aspects of his personality is a little mysterious. And so I went into office hours and I sat down, uh, this is in the second half of the year, probably January, actually about this time. And I said to him, Tony, why Freud? Why Freud, you know? Uh, and I didn't know him that well at the time. Uh, so he promptly turned this around in a way that he often does. And he goes back to me and he says, well, why Jung? And I didn't expect to be answering that question. So I paused for a long time. And finally, the answer that I gave was, you know, mm, of all of the classic psychodynamic theorists and the early psychotherapists, Jung takes most seriously the realities of the soul. And when I say the realities of the soul, I don't mean sort of, I don't mean this in a specifically sort of spiritual or metaphysical context. I don't mean that he was treating it in a religious fashion. What I mean is that Jung took very seriously the kind of spiritual experience that people have. Now, he attempted to interpret those experiences in psychological terms. You know, and you'll see a lot of relationship to what we're doing this course, but he took it seriously. He took people's experiences seriously. And I think that that is, you know, that's a big part of why I find him appealing, even when I agree with it, or I disagree rather, <laughs> that might've been a Freudian slip, uh, even when I disagree with at least half of his theory. Uh, you know, that, that's a running theme. I think I disagree with at least half of everybody's theory in most cases, and that's a healthy attitude because at least half of my theory is probably wrong too at this point, and I've changed my opinions over time. So this, this attention to the realities of the soul means that Jung, as a practitioner, took very seriously sort of spiritual crises, crises of meaning, okay? And one of the things that this manifests as is that Jung is not just concerned with trying to turn um, neurotic unhappiness into regular unhappiness, he wants to elevate people into a higher state. Not that he's going to banish unhappiness, but rather that he's, you know, the idea is that by, you know, interacting with the inner community, okay, the inner community of your parts, that you can develop a richness in your sense of self, but moreover, that your ego can stop thinking that it is the boss of the show all the time, okay? That your ego can stop thinking that it's the boss of the show. Because as it stands, your ego thinks it's the boss of the show. And if you sort of subscribe to Jungian theory, you'll find that there are other factors in your unconscious mind that just have much more influence. You are important. The ego is special. It has consciousness, right? And that matters. It does matter. It's unique and special and important. But that doesn't mean that it's the boss of everything. It doesn't mean that it's like in charge of everything. And as long as it holds that idea, right? It tends to be frankly, uh, you know, confused, but also unpleasant, 
right? Thinking that your ego is the boss of everything and that it's the master of the universe is gonna make you extremely unpleasant to other people, but also it creates all kinds of problems for you because regularly things happen and you're not in control, right? Not even of your own mind in many cases. So Jungian thinking takes that kind of thing seriously and it tends to look at spiritual issues and meaning issues in, in that way, that you need to get rid of this idea that you are the center of the show, okay? Um, a metaphor that I like to use in that respect, okay, is I compare it to um, finding out in some sense that the earth isn't the center of the solar system, right? So at a certain point in history, people looked up into the sky, they saw the sun rise in the east and set in the west, they saw the other planets moving around up there, and they were like, okay, earth is the center of the universe, right? But then the more they tried to measure those movements and predict them, the more complicated the models and things that they were developing to predict that became. It was just very hard to do. And then at some point, Copernicus comes along, and this was actually an old idea. It goes back to the Pythagoreans in ancient Greece, and the church knew about it a long time ago, but it sort of wasn't treated, um, it didn't have a lot of public attention, as it were. But Copernicus comes along at some point and says, well, uh, you know, it turns out that it's much easier to do the math that predicts how all these things move uh, if you pretend the sun is the center of the system and everything is going around the sun, right? Now, this is a big move, right, in a way, and Copernicus is cagey about it. Galileo later comes along and says, no, the sun is the center, and then the church kind of jumps down his throat a little bit, although that had to do with other things, but we'll talk about that maybe another day. The point is, right, we now look at it as kind of a given, if if you're not an Einsteinian, you know, we kind of look at it as a given that, yeah, the Earth goes around the sun, okay? Like everything else is orbiting around the sun. But that's a big change. And if you think about it that way, right, there is a distinction that exists within Jungian psychology, which is your, your ego, center of consciousness, but there is another center within the unconscious that you and all those unconscious forces are orbiting around. And it's called the self, with a capital S, the self. Okay. And the thing is that the ego, like the earth, looks up and it sees these other movements and it thinks, oh yeah, I'm at the, I'm in the middle. I'm the most important thing. But when you eventually switch your perspective and understand, no, the self is at the center, the self, like the sun is at the center and we're going around the self. It doesn't mean that you move to the sun. <laughs> yeah, you don't go live on the sun. That's a recipe for a very bad day, right? It's just that you change your perspective about what the relationship and importance between these parts is, what the actual dynamics of the system are. And you switch gradually from this idea where the ego is like, oh, I'm in charge, to being like, oh, I am part of an overall system that is in orbit around this other thing that is much bigger than me, and that sort of is much more important at the end of the day to the system, like the sun. And this is the capital S self. Okay. There's a lot more in both Freudian and Jungian psychology, but you know that's a little bit of a capsule version. I wanna talk about one other thing and then I wanna use a technique just so that we're keeping reasonably on track, right? And like, I'm gonna give you more as we go, obviously, but I wanted to unpack those ideas a little bit. Okay, so the other uh, sort of disciple, as it were, of Freud's that I wanna talk about a little bit um, is Edward Bernays. And Edward Bernays, people often ask me who I think sort of the most important psychodynamic theorist, right, of the 20th century was. And they're like, was it Freud? Was it Jung? And my answer to that is, nope, it was Edward Bernays. People are like, who? Uh, and psychologists often will be like, who? <laughs> so Edward Bernays, okay, was Freud's, Sigmund Freud's nephew, his American nephew. Um, you can learn about this pretty interestingly in a documentary, which you can watch for free online, called The Century of the Self, okay, The Century of the Self. Um, I recommend this documentary a lot and for good reason. So it is a four-part documentary, it's four separate hours, but if you watch the first hour of The Century of the Self, um, you, you'll get quite a bit of this. Uh, you should watch the whole thing because it's amazing. But, uh, but even if you just watch that first hour, you'll, you'll get quite a bit. So that first hour is about Edward Bernays. So here is that story in very condensed form. Edward Bernays, okay, <clears throat> was Sigmund Freud's nephew. Uh, and he was a propagandist. That is to say that he worked in the United States for the War Department making propaganda for World War I, okay, during World War I. And World War I 
uh, really ramped up the economy. They had to, they got production up and running, right, to make stuff for the war. And then when the war was over, they were producing a lot of stuff. And basically companies were stuck in this position where they were worried about being able to sell enough stuff to keep the bottom line going. So they basically they approached Edward Bernays and said, what do you think about the idea of using propaganda, right, to, to try to convince people to buy things? Using propaganda to convince people to buy things. And he's like, well, that's an interesting idea. Now we have a word for this. It's called advertising, right? And if you look at advertising before and after Edward Bernays, they're two very different things. Advertising before Edward Bernays was, um, you know, like buy gold bond foot powder. It keeps your feet the driest, right? Very functional, very about specific benefits and specific claims, right? Here is why this product is the best. Now you always had lies. You always had sort of scams and fake products and stuff, but that's not what Edward Bernays did. What Edward Bernays did was, okay, um, well, here's what happened. He sent some money to his uncle Sigmund in Europe because uncle Sigmund is having some financial troubles and Edward Bernays is doing pretty well. So he sends some money to him. In exchange, right, Freud sends his nephew a copy of his, his books. Here's my books, right? Just thank you. Here's a copy of my books. So Edward Bernays starts flipping through these and he's fascinated by Freud's theory about people being motivated by these unconscious impulses, sex, violence, right? Sex and fear. He looks at this and he thinks, oh, this is interesting. And the idea that you might be able to use symbols in order to get to this. So what he does is he begins to create advertisements and situations which are designed not to come at you directly by telling you the benefits of the product, but rather to create a set of associations with other things to make you want to buy things. That was his idea. He took Freudian psychology and he applied it into propaganda. That was his big innovation. And he called this, he needed a new term because he didn't want to call it propaganda. That had a bad name. So he came up with a new term. And the term he came up with was public relations, PR. So Edward Bernays invented PR, okay? Now there's a very famous instance of this. Um, you'll, you'll see this if you watch the documentary and I recommend you do, um, but, but it's, it's an interesting one. So at the time, cigarette companies were really stuck because um, women didn't smoke, basically. Women didn't smoke cigarettes. They were considered dirty, okay? They were considered unfeminine and whatever. And the cigarette companies obviously wanted to sell more cigarettes and they were hoping to break into that market because they're like, well, if this is half the population, if we can get them smoking, that's a huge boost, right? But they didn't have much luck. So Edward Bernays comes up with this idea. And so what he does is he sort of leaks it to the press that there's gonna be a big thing, a big thing happening at like the, the parade. There's like a Macy's Day parade or something coming up, right? And he arranges with some society debutantes. So these are basically like early feminists, the rich women who are sort of feminists, right? Early feminists, like suffragettes. He arranges with them that at a prearranged signal in the parade, they'd be walking along and they would all take out a cigarette and light it, right? And he released this phrase to the press. He, they would be lighting it as torches of freedom, torches of freedom. Now see what he's done. He's created a symbolic resonance here. It's no longer that the cigarettes like aid digestion or something. It's that they're linked to something else. They're part of like, you know, getting masculine power, equal rights, torches of freedom, these cigarettes. In the 10 years or something after he pulls this stunt, the rate of smoking among women shoots through the roof. Okay. His own wife, in fact, um, ended up taking up smoking and he tried to get her to quit for years and years and years. And if I'm not wrong, she eventually died of cancer which is sort of tragic, right? Ironic, but tragic. So, right. So Edward Bernays has lots of success with this. Um, he, he applies these techniques all over the place. And in a sense, right, Edward Bernays, he revolutionized what we think of as advertising. And the reason that I consider him to be the most, uh, the reason that I consider him to sort of be the most influential um, psychodynamic theorist or practitioner of the 20th century is simple. If you think about it, 
the modern world that we live in is completely dependent on this kind of thing. Why? The economy, as we know, has to be in a state of continuous growth, right? If the growth in the economy drops below 2%, we're all in trouble, right? That's, you know, we know that. And so it's continuous growth. And you can think about how possible it can be to have infinite continuous growth in a finite world, but that's the idea. So because of that, basically people need to be buying more stuff like, or they're required by that economic system to buy more stuff than they need. You have to buy things that you don't need. If you just buy things and they, you know, you don't buy much, you just buy what you need and it lasts you a long time, that's not enough for this economy. You have to be buying more stuff. And so if you look at advertising, so much advertising is designed to either pull on your fears or to, um, to appeal to other things. Consider the advertising for Axe Body Spray. If you've ever seen the early ads for Axe Body Spray, you know, a guy sprays body spray on himself, and then all of a sudden there's like a wave of beautiful women chasing him down the street. Now, none of us consciously look at that ad and say to ourselves, hmm, seems to attract women. But Axe Body Spray sells, like, right? They sell a lot of it. And why? It's not particularly good cologne, right? There are some decent smells, but it's like not high quality cologne. However, although consciously you're saying, well, you know, this seems like manipulation, you buy it anyway. And it's the same thing. Cars get linked to feelings. It's about how they make you feel, right? It's about appealing to this, these drives, how it makes you feel. And so people buy things because of the symbolic implications of those things, how they make them feel rather than the utility of the product themselves. That's Edward Bernays. And Edward Bernays and that sort of revolution in that sense, that's, that's the world we live in. Like think about it, advertising, right? Um, and interestingly, Edward Bernays actually, he was, a, he was big on sort of celebrity endorsement. <laughs> so he was an early guy who would get, you know, some, some celebrity of the time period to like take the product and, and go, hmm, this is so wonderful. This is what I like to use, right? as a way of luring people in with it. Uh, and you can see that, you know, that's never really gone away, but boy, has it had a massive surge in the form of influencers. I mean, that's the whole influencer game, right? The influencer game is you like that person and they use that product. And sometimes it's very obvious what they're doing. Um, but, you know, that's basically, that's the whole thing. You know, if you're an Instagram influencer, your job basically right, is to appeal to people from, for the most part, there are a few that aren't like that, but to appeal to people and then you get product endorsements. So if you think about it, right, that whole system that Edward Bernays created pretty much, right, is responsible for a huge amount of what we see. He is one of the architects of the modern world. So anyway, interesting fact, that documentary is Century of the Self. I highly recommend it, all four parts, but minimally watch that first hour and you'll find it very interesting. Okay, so that's psychodynamics in a nutshell. I, I recognize that we're covering a lot of material relatively quickly, but I wanna give you kind of a sampler. So a technique that I wanna talk about today that is a psychodynamic technique emerges from Gestalt therapy, okay? It emerges from Gestalt therapy and it's called chair work, okay? Chair work. Now there are two forms of chair work, empty chair and two chair, okay? Empty chair and two chair. Two chair work, is about dealing with splits within yourself, okay? So it's about dealing with issues with your own inner dynamics. And we'll cover that a little bit more, but it's sort of internal, okay? It's about your own relationships with yourself. That's two chair work. Empty chair work has to do with your relationships with other people. It has to do with unfinished business. So let me describe each of these briefly. In two chair work, you might be working with somebody um, a lot and you might notice that they have a really strong um, self-critical angle, right? So you'll talk to them and they'll say, well, you know, I was at work, but oh God, I was so stupid, this kind of thing, right? Or they'll just be like, well, you know, I screwed it up, but like, oh, I always screw stuff up, that kind of thing. It's very common, right, to get that self-critical voice. Many of you, right, most of you probably, will experience at one time or another this internal sense of criticism right, that, you're, that it seems like some part of your own mind is attacking you in various ways. And sometimes that can be very harsh, right, very distressing, right, because it's like you're not good enough, you're not whatever, like it can say really terrible things to us and it can drive us to sort of 
right? All, all sorts of things. It's like, if we're not thin enough, we starve ourselves. If we're not successful enough, we work ourselves into the ground. If we're not whatever, like, right? That self-critical voice can have a huge impact on us. So, and that's just one kind of split. There are other kinds of splits, okay? But let's say that somebody was dealing with that kind of self-critical split, right? That self-criticizing, self-critical split. Here's what you would do. So you get two chairs. So here you are in the consulting office. You, the therapist, are, are sitting sort of in a third chair, maybe sitting on the couch or something, and you put two chairs kind of facing each other, okay? And the client sits in one chair, and you ask them to sort of separate out in some sense, try to separate out their regular consciousness that's hearing this stuff, their ego, right, from this critical component, this critical voice, this critical split. And so what you get them to do is, first, you get them to sit in the critical split chair, and they imagine themselves over in the other chair, and you say, okay, now I want you to say, I want you to vocalize what the critical split is saying, right? What is it saying to you? And so they sit, and often this is a little awkward to start with. I mean, it's weird for everybody, but people get into it pretty quickly and they'll start talking to themselves, right? In the other chair, they'll be like, you're lazy and you suck and you never tried anything and you never finish anything. And you're so you let them do this and it can be pretty intense, pretty emotional, but you let them sort of blast that other chair, okay? Then you kind of hold them after they've done a bit of a blast, you get them to stand up, you shift them to the other chair, and then you say, okay, now I want you to be the receiving consciousness, the witnessing consciousness that's getting this stuff. How does that make you feel? And they'll turn to you and start talking to you, and then you'll say, no, 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 no. Tell the split how it makes you feel, right? Tell the split how it makes you feel. And so they'll say, well, you know, when you say that stuff, it makes me feel really bad and like, you know, whatever, you know, like it makes me feel bad and it's really hurting my feelings and, right? So you'll do that for a little bit and then you will switch them back into the other chair and you'll say, okay, be the critical split again. How do you respond to that? And you can see what you're doing. There's a back and forth. And when this works, and it often does, um, I, I have to admit that when I first did these techniques, I was not, I didn't see any reason why they would work any better than certain other kinds of like purely imagination-based or writing-based or conversation-based techniques, right? But there's something about the chairs that makes a difference. I think it must be the ability to like assign a physical space. I have some theories about that, but that's neither here nor there. So the point is when it works, when it's effective, it's remarkable. People will get this back and forth dialogue going and you will watch a conversation begin to emerge in this back and forth way. Now, this is an important theme in psychodynamic work generally, which we'll talk about, which is if you can find a way to externalize in some way, one of those dynamics in order to get some dialogue going, you can improve the relationship. If you've, you know, if you watched it, think about what I talked about when I talked about pulling up the piece of yourself that was smoking, right? The hypnosis piece. It's like you externalize it to your regular ego, and then you can get a proper conversation going, right? Similar kind of thing. You're externalizing a piece of yourself, and you're trying basically to work at your relationship. And if it works, and it often does, what eventually happens is that the critical piece will eventually like kind of keep laying it on and eventually the witnessing consciousness will kind of collapse and it'll eventually say like you're just you're hurting me like you're making me so sad and people will often weep that's not uncommon okay it's in fact a marker if you look for it at which point it's not uncommon for the critical split the critical component to soften and it's like like well i didn't mean to make you feel bad i was just trying to help you like you know, I, I just wanted you to, to do well and so on and so forth. You'll get this softening and this increase. Now, this isn't the kind of thing where like, bam, you do it in 10 minutes and it's done and that's that, right? It's, it's not that kind of thing. It's the kind of thing you would do a lot of times, but it eventually begins to create a real change in that dynamic and that psychodynamic between these this piece, the critical piece that seems to be separated from and attacking the ego all the time, right? So see how that works, inner split, dialogue, and then you get conversation going. And the therapist is there to guide it and facilitate it and instruct and so on and so forth, right? But also to make observations, right? To pay attention to the things that may be slipping past um, each of them and to keep stuff on task, to keep people from sidestepping the technique. Okay, empty chair as a technique is about you and other people. And specifically it has to do with um, unfinished business. Okay, unfinished business. So unfinished business is, you know, when you have an emotional issue with somebody and you just can't, 
for whatever reason, work it out with them. Okay. Maybe they're dead. You know, they may have, they may have died. And so you just, you can't have that. Maybe you're estranged, right? Maybe your relationship has just gone to a point where it's just impossible to get through to them in one way or another. And the idea with unfinished business is, right, it gives you an opportunity to have those conversations that you need to have with them. But instead of them in the outside world, what you do is you have this empty chair. So the client is sitting in a chair here and they imagine that person in the empty chair. You put an empty chair, here, they imagine them into it. And it's important, they imagine them in a lot of detail. What are they wearing, right? And then you sort of take it through like, okay, how are they dressed? What's their posture, so on and so forth. And then you get them to, de to describe and imagine the face. What, what's their face doing and what's their facial expression? Very important, right? What's the emotional state of their facial expression? That tells you a lot. And then they proceed to basically have a conversation of this kind, right? Where they sort of imagine what that person says and they say things to them back and forth. Now, the idea with this is this, if you have this kind of unfinished business with somebody, somebody who's gone from your life or somebody that you just can't communicate to, the emotional reactions that you're having are occurring in your psyche. It's not, it, like it is about them, obviously, their behavior impacts on things in lots of ways, but your emotional reactivity to those things is about you. If you've ever had the experience of what I call arguing with ghosts, which is where you're pissed off at somebody and you're like blah, 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 having an argument with them, but they're not there, right? And those conversations are generally, in my experience, worthless. All you end up doing is pre preparing a bunch of like, aha, and then I'll say this, and then I'll say this and it never fits, never works. If you try to roll that stuff out, the conversation doesn't go the way you expect it. But if you use any of those like prepared lines, it's very obvious they're prepared and they don't quite fit. <laughs> so it's kind of worthless to do it in that way. But in a way, this isn't an argument with a ghost, right? It's a conversation with a ghost. You have that, you have a structured opportunity to have this back and forth so that you can start to work out your issues, okay? With your image of that person with the model of that person that lives in your head. Now, um, right, and the idea is you begin to resolve that. Now, these two things, these empty chair and two chair technique, you're gonna use those two things together and they're not, you don't use them alone. They're part of an overall set of um, sort of techniques and, and approaches and stuff that you would use, but they originate in gestalt, they have a very psychodynamic kind of frame. You see them used in things like EFT, emotion focused therapy, um, which I was trained in. Um, and you can see in those interactions, right, a little more of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about trying to get psychodynamics. You'll notice that the self-critical split isn't the id, right? It isn't the Jungian shadow, right? It, it has a different label, it's a different thing, but it is, a kind of a rogue part of your mind, something that you are not quite in contact with, that you are having conflict with within your own mind. And so trying to get a dialogue going, treating it as though it is a separate being long enough to get an actual dialogue going and then re-internalizing it can often help to quiet that voice, bring it on side so you experience less of that kind of thing, right? It's a powerful technique. It's a powerful technique. Okay, so we're gonna expand so much of what I've talked about today. I, I barely got to talk about dissociation. There's almost so much to talk about, um, but I, I think I'm slightly maybe past an hour and I deliberately wanna keep things a little light because I know people will be working away uh, on their stuff. Um, okay, so that's what we're talking about on the psychotherapy side today. We'll elaborate all that stuff, but consider reflecting on that stuff and trying to, to bring it in a dialogue, okay? All right, and on to the second half. <laughs>